World Congress is a Congress of which I expect that uh, it's going to be the most wonderful we've had ever. It's probably the best World Congress in regional anesthesia and pain medicine. We've planned a fantastic program and many, many people will come. 200 speakers again, worldwide from the five continents and also a lot of workshops, more and more workshops. With a perfect ratio of one to six, so that uh, each individual will be able to get the maximum out of this Congress. We will have a great ambience with probably 3,000 participants and so many lectures about pain medicine, about regional anesthesia. You'll be able to meet people who are really, really interested in what they are doing. You won't get lost because we'll keep this uh, spirit of uh, being within a family. I hope to see you in Paris in 6 to 9 September 2023 for the World Congress of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to bring to you all greetings from the Asian Oceanic Society of Region Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. I'm Dr. Bala Venkat, the immediate past president of AOSRAPN and the current academic chairman. We are extremely fortunate to do this webinar in collaboration with the European Society of Regional Anesthesia. And it's, it's really nice that we would be very, very happy to collaborate with sister societies across the globe. And sincere thanks uh, for ESRA for this joint webinar with AYSRAPM. And uh, I welcome all the participants for this session. And uh, many of them, I look forward to meeting you next week in the World Congress of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine at Paris. And until then, uh, we will go through this session, uh, which is essentially focused on thoracic pain. And uh, we have excellent speakers lined up for this session to discuss on the various components of thoracic trauma, thoracic analgesia, and pain relief, both in adult and in pediatrics. And um, the first uh, speaker will be me. Before I go into it, I would want it, all those who are participating in this webinar, if they have questions that they need to post, will be very happy to pose their questions in the question answer session and all the questions will be answered in the last. And uh, I'm Dr. Jay Balavenkit. Um, I'm a consultant anesthesiologist working in a 650 bed trauma center in India. And uh, it's a busy clinical unit, but the advantage is uh, the anesthesiologists work as perioperative physicians. Anesthesiologists are the ones which they take take the lead in treating the trauma victim. And we introduced the concept of on arrival block to all of the trauma victims, including thoracic trauma. So the first lecture, which uh, we are going to speak, is going to discuss and share our views on on arrival block to trauma patient, including all the, all the trauma which come in to just showcase uh, the concept and the challenges that we face when we do an honorable block in trauma. Uh, so now uh, will be my presentation on honorable block and our thoughts on that. Greetings on behalf of the Asian Oceanic Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. We feel delighted to collaborate with the European Society of Regional Anesthesia in this joint uh, venture to share the knowledge between member societies. Today, 
the next few minutes i am going to speak on on arrival nerve block for trauma patients the lessons that we have learned from our institution i bring to you greetings from the city of coimbatore which is in the southern part of the state of tamil nadu and india and this is the statue of adi yogi uh, which uh, one of the largest human bust in the world emphasizing the importance of yoga in daily life and i would consider that anesthesiologist and the anesthesia as a very very sacred branch of medical care because it offers to the patient the most important comfort when they come into a hospital that is pain more so when it is with a patient who has had an acute injury due to trauma i bring to you greetings from ganga medical center and hospital coimbatore the hospital where i work it's a 650 bed tertiary care referral center for trauma orthopedics major spine reconstructive and microvascular surgery we have 38 operating rooms and it's a busy clinical unit we operate about 125 surgeries every day and 60% of this is related to trauma we have with us about 86 anesthesiologists who work as perioperative physicians and not only anesthesia care and one of the important component of the perioperative care is to do an on arrival block to the trauma victim and make them pain free the minute they enter the hospital for this i would like to thank the founder and the directors of the hospital and the heads of department of orthopedic and plastic surgery for allowing us to do this service to all the surgical injured patients who come into our institution and the philosophy of our hospital the ganga medical center and hospital coimbatore the philosophy of our hospital has been that the minute a trauma victim comes in in spite of being a private institution we would go ahead and do all the services that are needed to preserve life including resuscitation of the patient without expecting an attendant to be there without expecting any money that is to be deposited to start the treatment process even if they are not insured we go ahead and make sure that they get adequate care and resuscitation and also one of the other important philosophy has been to make them pain free on arrival but to make this happen we need to have the senior consultant on call 24 hours a day 365 days a year and we have evolved a strategy where a senior anesthesiologist is available in house along with 10 other anesthesiologists even at night to make sure that resuscitation and pain relief is done immediately and instantly the amount of comfort that this offers to the patient is phenomenal if you just see this is an industrial accident and you see the amount of trauma to the right upper limb and but also to see how comfortable the patient is within minutes of arriving into the hospital all this has been made possible by application of a nerve block on arrival pain in trauma is very severe and it is often under treated across the globe and most of them pose a challenge because they are full stomach we also know that the regional blocks provide excellent site specific pain relief and analgesia without producing any side effect including hemodynamic side effects and they do not have anything with myocardial depression and they are extremely cost effective for the comfort they offer to the patient so the protocol that we created in our institution is when you receive a trauma victim we go by the trauma life support protocol of airway with 
total spine control, especially the cervical spine, breathing with ventilatory support, circulation with hemorrhage control, disability and looking at the neurological evaluation. Having done A, B, C, D, then we go into site specific block and after which we go for the exposure and completely undress the patient. To quickly go through, when a tissue is traumatized, the nociceptors are the free nerve endings or stimulated and the pain is carried by the C fibers and A delta fibers. So the first pain that is perceived is because of the A delta fibers, the pain is very fast, it is very sharp and well localized. The second pain or the slower onset pain is duller and often poorly localized and it is carried by the C fibers. So in our hospital, we also make it a policy that apart from giving the nerve block to the peripheral nerve, we also embark on the journey to offer this patient the multimodal pain therapy to make sure that we decrease the intensity of the pain, the peripheral sensitization and the central sensitization for the patient the minute they arrive. So just not the block alone, but we go ahead and give multimodal analgesia. Why is regional block good in a trauma situation? The conventional pain management uses a lot of opioids, which produces drowsiness and consequently respiratory depression. However, uh, when you use site specific, it becomes the patient is very clear and very lucid and he will be able to communicate well. And it's very, very helpful when we get injuries like this, where intraoperatively, we also discuss with the patient about the outcome, whether we have to go for an amputation or a reconstruction is still possible. So whom do we offer this regional gloves? We offer it to all the patients with upper extremity injuries, hip and lower extremity injuries. Now we moved into giving it for chest injuries, even spine injuries and abdominal injuries. With the advent of newer blocks, the blocks have been becoming a component of every nerve and interfacial plane blocks also started helping us in thoracic and abdominal compartmental region. So when we do honorable block, we have to be always be aware of the associated injuries. Sometimes the blocks can become life threatening, especially when you are giving an honorable block to a patient with an upper extremity block with a cervicals with a, a injury to the um, a clavicle fracture and possibly brachial plexus. And uh, when you place the drug in giving a brachial block, it may seep in and can produce a high spinal. So just I'm giving an example. When you do an on arrival block, you have to be aware of the associated possible injuries and complications that could arise out of that. And in a trauma, we shouldn't fall for the obvious. And so it's very pertinent before you embark on the block, you also have definitely have to done the primary survey. So use of universal precautions like wearing a glove and wearing all the important uh, personal protective equipment is important for the care provider, the anesthesiologist. And it's also important that uh, when you're confronted with a brachial plexus injury, you need to document if there is a deficit or no deficit, discuss with the surgical team whether to go ahead in giving the block and also look at the peripheral nerve injuries that are associated with trauma and do document it. So where we do this block, all these patients, irrespective of the day or night, there is a separate ante room to the operating room where we receive the trauma patients and this is a place where all the facilities are available to both resuscitate the patient and the treat the complications of the nerve block. So we, this is the ante room of the operating theater. This is the block room. We have an emergency cot, monitor equipment. We get informed consent. Working intravenous line, a very calm and quiet and well equipped block room. We communicate with the patient. And as I said, it's available 24 hours. We do it in our institution throughout the day. 
and made sure that trained personnel and USG machine is available all the time. And you just see the comfort level of this patient. The advent of ultrasound has immensely changed the way we practice regional analgesia in trauma patients. We make sure that the drug is deposited where it is to be deposited without injuring the lung and the pleura in a patient like this with upper extremity. The minute we give the block, within 10 minutes when the block takes, we take the benefit of applying tunique to a bleeding patient and decrease the bleeding. In fact, we do the x-rays of the patient only after giving the block, an AP view, a lateral view, an oblique view, which the surgeon asks, is done only after the patient has been sorry, has been given the block so that we get excellent x-rays. We extend this honorable block also to surgical anesthesia. For example, this is a 10-finger replant, took 17 hours, but bilateral blocks were given one above the clavicle, one below the clavicle. And uh, this is a common scenario, honorable block extending as a sole anesthetic agent for many of our patients who come with such significant amputation. You see the teams working in and uh, bilateral block, as I said, one above the clavicle, one below the clavicle, and you see two teams operating excellent results in microvascular surgeries. And only thing is we remember when we do these blocks, if there is a contralateral chest injury, this side, when we do the block on the side of, side of injury, we always go below clavicle block so that we don't produce any respiratory distress. The key thing to good outcome has been the arrival of the patient into the operating room from the resuscitation room and the block room. We kept it minimal and we start the surgeries very early. Patients who come with hip fractures, we, they, immediately they will receive either a fascia iliaca block, pen block or a femoral block. Mostly it's a geriatric population, but they do extremely well. We give it immediately on arrival. And now we have started using dexamethasone as an adjuvant, which helps them to give good analgesia for the first 16 to 22 hours. And when we deal with tibial fractures, uh, we are very cautious because of the possibility of a compartment syndrome. But for example, a fracture like this, we go in for a femoral and sciatic block, but we closely monitor the patients for compartment syndrome. All the chest injuries, especially with uh, fractured ribs, get either thoracic epidural, thoracic paravertebral block, an ESP block or serratus anterior block, which helps them to do good physiotherapy and we prevent in lung issues. The controversies that are there with honorable block include acute compartment syndrome, which you have to be careful in monitoring this patient after giving the block and pre-existing nerve injuries to be recorded. And patients who have been on anticoagulant go for a superficial block. And always remember, if we do this, we prevent the development of chronic pain syndrome and post-traumatic stress disorder. This is just to give an example of uh, how compartment syndrome happened, especially in upper tibial fractures. And here is how the patient developed a compartment syndrome. This is one case which I just wanted to keep in record that this is a possibility and you need to keep monitoring and do a fasciotomy immediately. So the take home messages are uh, on arrival block in trauma, it needs an institutional protocol. It needs the availability of a trained personnel. It needs the availability of the infrastructure to treat the complication arising from the nerve block at the same time to do the process of resuscitation. Primary survey is a must before we embark on the journey of giving the block. Site-specific analgesia offers very, very effective pain relief. It helps in quick shift of the patients to the OR to start the surgical procedure. It also extends into the post-operative period with producing good pain relief. And early use of this in trauma decreases the development of chronic pain and post-traumatic stress disorder and also decreases morbidity, including pulmonary morbidity, all this at a very, very less cost. So as an anesthesiologist, I think it is prudent and it's very, very important that we take an O to alleviate acute pain in trauma and bring in smiles to every trauma patient. Sincere thanks for the opportunity and I look forward for any questions later. Thank you so much. So, um, so we saw the first uh, talk, uh, which was predominantly focused on uh, how to make
the services available to trauma victim uh, throughout the 24 hours. From here, we move on to the next talk. I have great pleasure in introducing Dr. Brushali Pondey. She's the current secretary of the Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India. She was also the past president of the Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India. She's extremely active in the uh, Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesia, ASPA, which is going to uh, be uh, taking over the leadership soon. And uh, her focus has been on pediatric regional. She has uh, two textbooks to her credit, uh, which talks about uh, the basics of ultrasound and the use of ultrasound. I have great pleasure in introducing Dr. Grishali Ponde, uh, who lives and practices in the big metropolis, Mumbai, in India. Over to Dr. Grishali Ponde. Namaste. And a happy hello to everybody who has logged in for this webinar from all across the globe. And to that, I want to share this quote which this great man said that there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. And I'm so glad we are looking at this particular aspect from the point as follows. We're going to look at the differences between the child's thoracic cage and that of an adult. Let us look at the commonest thoracic cage pain that the pediatric population presents to us with. We will look at the non-RA options, we'll look at the regional options, and then we will take certain precise take-home messages and let's make it clear as crystal. So the chest wall is far more compliant, the thoracic cage is far more compliant, the intercostal muscles are weak, the diaphragm is flatter and the air small and the airways are smaller. And from the newborn to adulthood, these are the time points of maturation, more prone for hypoxia and, the, and they can decompensate faster. Imagine what happens to it when pain is added into this kind of a delicate and dainty thoracic compensate very, very fast. Coming to various causes of chest wall pain in children, it could be pleuritic, it could be cardiac, uncommon, but, but, but yes. Then it could be costochondritis, it could be musculoskeletal pain due to overexertion maybe, it could be rib fractures, and then it could be psychogenic and idiopathic chest pain. We as anesthesiologists, where can we be called? Definitely in a couple of scenarios more than others, which are chest wall and surgery. Let's look into that. So chest wall trauma sure at some point or the other pain relief is definitely required so we are required to give pain relief to to rib fractures pain relief to icd insertions pain relief to even removal of an icd and uh, for speech therapy and so on so in trauma what we see is rib fractures blunt trauma and penetrating trauma is rather rare in not you know like trauma to thoracic cage itself is less as compared to adults so let us broaden the perspective and look at it as trauma, perioperative pain and procedural pain in ICU where we can be of help or we can we, we can have certain protocols placed. So this is how we, we are going to look at this particular topic. Commonest surgeries are say in neonatal age group, the tracheosophageal fistula or even that that there is the, the the age group can be any impact so it can be a uh, three three kilogram and it can be even a 90 kilogram or even a hundred kilogram so this was one of the interesting cases that i have ever given anesthesia to a toy wheel was swallowed by a kid and that toy wheel, wheel in fact perforated the esophagus and was in the in the thoracic cavity we had to remove it by vats and it actually made headings in our national papers so these are the surgeries that you would be called more often. So wax is again very, very common. And uh, yes, these are the places where you would be called to give analgesia, of course, other than just anesthesia. Now, if you look at the pain pathway as such, there are various, va various points where in the pathway, actually, where we can intervene. And hence, there are various ways of treating thoracic cage pain or any pain for that matter. So look at the humble paracetamol. The slide is busy, but please note the dosages because they change as children grow. And they are, uh, if 
are of an effect only when they are given in a dose that is recommended so that the clinical effect is sufficient. So please note this. Coming to non-opioid alternatives, ibuprofen and diclofenac are more common in our practice. We liberally use even suppositories if, I, if oral route or IV route is something that is not acceptable. Coming to opioids, we do not have opioid crisis in India. We do use opioid whenever they we can use and whenever they are available. However, we are very biased towards regional anesthesia. Coming to opioids anyway, let me not take a detour. We use fentanyl and morphine. We even have fentanyl patches. I think the commonest fentanyl patch that I might pick up is say 25 microgram of fentanyl patch, which will which will liberate or which would give 25 micrograms in one hour. So that's one microgram per kilogram for a 25 kilogram of tide. Now, let's look at the highway of what regional options are. And this is how it would look like. So from regional options from the central neuroaxis right till the anterior, it goes as follows. You can see the epidural space here. So we have a thoracic epidural space, we have paravert, we have erector spinae, we have intercostal, and then we have the pec ones, the pec twos, the saps, and then we have the transversus thoracis. Interpleural, we have given up because the in small children, of course, the uptake is too much, and we really don't want local anesthetic systemic toxicity to set in because we are going to put catheters there. Coming to the highway and where we can intervene. A quick look, thoracic epidural is one good option. Yes, it is a gold standard, but there are very various other ways too. And we are going to look at when we are going to practice this. We are going to look at paravertebral, ESP, intercostal, pec and sap. We are going to look at transversus thoracis. Each has its own peculiarity and each has its own advantage. So the choice amongst all this, you decide depend on the depending upon the case the invasiveness of the case for how many days do you really require the pain relief do you require the pain relief with ongoing physiotherapy as well so all this is going to go into deciding which block you're going to pick up suppose if you have a case of this kind a day two comes for top repair as and at the same time has duodenal atresia what am i going to do i'm going to put an epidural right in the center and put the catheter in a way that it gives analgesia to the thoracic work as well as the abdominal work and then the surgery can really go on and even fully continue in the post-operative period, set up infusions. So this is how we would give dental neuroaxial blocks. I'm sorry, they're not relinquished, not at least as I look at it, they have their place and they can be mastered pretty easily. And if we can get very, very site specific and you can get complete analgesia, all that depends. You, you know, what really matters is the site that you choose and how specific can you get there. So this is almost a higher lumbar epidural. And loss of resistance is always elicited by normal saline. And calculate the length of the catheter that will be inserted inside the epidural space. Ultrasound definitely has added accuracy to this. We can always use that to see where the tip of the catheter is to make it as congruent to the surgical incision as it can get. And this is one of the good modalities that we use even today. Now, never underestimate simplicity in regional anesthesia. We are going to go to all the other blocks, but let us dwell into this. Let us pause for a while and dwell into the simplicity. Well, this is a caudal portal through which you can go right till the higher thoracic level in a baby. And this is how it can be done. A simple 18 gauge needle. Give a caudal in any ways that you usually give the easiest, the simplest block. Use this portal liberally dilate the space a little and give the curve and, and pass the catheter to this, this portal to whatever level that you want. Assess if you want with ultrasound. See the drug spread. See the dural sac if you wish. If you don't have it, calculate the distance and go ahead and put 
that much of epidural catheter from the skin inside the epidural space. You have ultrasound with it. Nothing stops you from really following this up. Mind you, the take care of the draping at that time. Take care that the that the baby is warm enough, and then yes, do it as accurately as you can under ultrasound guidance. This still has a role to play today. I repeat, yes, there are newer blocks coming up, and we are going to look at them, and we are going to take a very balanced decision of what to pick up when we really need. So for a super invasive surgery. Prolonged procedures, nothing. Yes, if this is what you know, go ahead with it. But treat them with respect. See to it that they're away from all the other lines. Keep this kind of warning so that nobody tampers them and take care of it. Now, coming to thoracic, this is we go ahead with this. But as as we go higher and higher up in the thorax, the angle does play a role. So I'm going to I I'm going to show you that as well. But look, the needle is almost straight, and we do get a loss of resistance. So let's come to a typical higher thoracic work. Now look at the angle that would be taken in this. And to begin with itself, the insertion point you get it at an angle, and then you ask the attendant to give a counter pressure from the other side. Palpate the upper spine once again. Make sure that your track is right, and then elicit the loss of resistance. And now see the change in angle for the thoracic epidural in a child. So yes, these are modalities which are available, which can be mastered. And of course, after the loss of resistance, calculate the centimeters of catheter that you want to put it and secure. Coming to non-invasive surgeries as such as as wax. Even for thoracotomies, by all means, we can give a paravert. But paravert is very well, uh, can be can be taken up very well for VAT procedures and even for thoracotomies. So for these kind of surgeries where there are no big incisions, yes, this is this is one decortication case going on. In fact, and um, we've given a one lung anesthesia, and here. Well, the surgeon is peacefully working with a silent chest, as it were, with no lung coming in. And let me show you the lung now moving up once the cuff is deflated off from the one lung anesthesia. Here, what we would give for pain relief is, yes, we can give paravert. Then, but could I? Would I give it? Would I ask the surgeon to do it from inside? I would be a bit skeptical because, of course, we are going from an infective procedure up. Would I would I be very very comfortable giving it from posterior uh, of the body? I would be a little worried to play around the dura with my local anesthetic, especially when I know that it. I mean, the, the pleura is all infected and can gutter the infection in the epidural space. So I get worried there. So ESP would be a good choice here. So ESP would go like this. This is the probe and the needle placement, longitudinal scan. And let me halt the scan for you. Let me get this back and halt the scan for you here. This is the transverse process. This is the erector spinae, and we simply have to pick this up, or in other words, make a space there with the local anesthetic insertion in injection, and you can actually put in a catheter in a longitudinal scan so that a length of catheter stays. Just right above the transverse process, and it doesn't avulse out once they work. Mind you, the catheter fixation might come in the field of the surgeon, so mind, uh, take be mindful of that. That's all. We like to do it this way because the tip of the transverse process is always very well understood in a transverse scan lab rather than a longitudinal scan. This is what we believe. So we can give our ESP in this way. Or of course the good paravertebral, it's a fantastic block to work in. Block. So we'll come to paravertebral a little later once again. So this is these are certain articles that have come up for ESP. Oh, there are many, in fact, but this is just that came to my uh, attention. Now coming to paravertebral block as such. Now look at the wonderful transverse section of a little baby and the whole thing is revealed in front of you so you can get a transverse scan in the thorax and here is the story of paravertebral told to you so clearly this is the tip of the transverse process and this is the rib rib is again cartilaginous in them and you can see the pleura and this is actually the paravertebral space waiting to be blocked in a longitudinal scan 
you can see the tip of the transverse process and these are the this is the erector spinae to be worked upon and this is the paravertebral spacing almost neighbors isn't it so let's come close to the sternum as you can see the probe is right on the sternum atop it we can actually see the two muscles where we need to block so what we can do is the transverse thoracic plane block would be deposition of the local anesthetic in between the inner intercostal muscle and the transverse thoracic a good block for sternal procedures or wounds as we scan even more lateral you start seeing the ribs and this is where we can actually place the intercostal blocks so the neurovascular bundle is always at the lower part of the upper rib remember this anatomy and go ahead with your block the pec 1 the pec 2 and the saps are approaching now and let's watch them slide the probe in the parasagittal section you start seeing you start seeing in fact the intraclavicular area you start seeing the pec 1 and the pec 2 muscles slide the probe up again in the parasagittal section even the transverse section is fine and look at the thoracoacromial artery here telling you that this is a good place to give you for us to inject the local anesthetic now here we start seeing the latissimus dorsi and the serratus anterior okay. so this would be the serratus anterior plane block you could keep half of your local anesthetic here and half of the local anesthetic in between the serratus anterior and the rib as such or you can give uh, just in between these two muscles that also would be enough and this block would be good along with pec 1 and pec 2 for the rib fractures so trauma fracture rib choices well we have many pick up the one which you are most used to and see if you really want it for long period so that you can put in a catheter and you can give chest physiotherapy as well before you embark upon knee block for that matter as you see there are plethora of choices coming up we and need to understand the fundamentals of pra the good news is the tissues here are very supple the fibrous tissues of the fascias and the facial planes very supple the block that doesn't take much to act the percolation is easier but we need to be very very thorough with our dosages just remember one line 0.5 ml per kilogram of 0.25% of rupivacaine or 0.2% of rupivacaine should do the trick and of course facial plane blocks you need more volume then decrease the concentration dilute them even more further we can add additives in our blocks definitely clonidine is the one which we pick up each day every day with a dose of 1 microgram per kilogram in nutshell of course there are many options to give uh, analgesia from master certain basic to common blocks for thoracic cage choose your block case by case and of course keep learning the newer lies you know i love this movie and and this particular clip from term of endearment and see what happens when there is untreated pain as such so look at the plight of this young lady who's Uh, whose child is in pain is reminding people and uh, and she's telling everyone that, that the time is around for another shot of pain relief and the time is up <laughs> so uh, if you if if we really want to do if we really want to do a holistic job of treating thoracic cage pain or any pain for that matter simple fundamentals should be remembered what are our choices go multimodal see to it that they're dispensed well and see to it that they're executed well and of course keep charting if pain so that some escalations can be done or you can call your other colleagues to see if something else is going on and if you put catheters get married to them till they are out we have enjoyed speaking on this topic and i
So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vrushali, for uh, elaborating. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Sandeep Divan, who is the academic director of the Sancheti Hospital in Pune. He's a regional enthusiast and he's the current editor-in-chief of the Indian Journal of Regional Anesthesia. And he has been a past president of the Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India. And uh, Dr. Sandeep Divan is going to enumerate to us on adult thoracic trauma, is there a role of thoracic paravertebral block? Is there a resurgence? Uh, he's going to uh, take us through this journey. Over to Dr. Sandeep Divan. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, ISRA OSRA meet. And the topic is Would there be a resurgence of thoracic paravertebral block? Again, I would like you to wel welcome for this uh, 40th ISRA annual congress. And this is my agenda during the whole congress. And uh, you can register for this uh, particular congress. We are going to look into the cohort of multiple refractures and the recent trends of regional anesthesia for refractures, which have been very site specific. For example, in the lateral refractures, it's the serratus anterior block, which has taken over the thoracic paravertebral block when the refracture is more than seven. Uh, this is the uh, particular article which mentions this uh, uh, algorithm. A few years later, in 2020, it was the uh, ESPB, that is the erector spinae plane block for the posterior lateral refractures, which took over the thoracic epidural and the thoracic paravertebral blocks. So the thoracic epidural is at this point, the thoracic paravertebral at this point, and the erector spinae plane block at this point. So these would address the, the posterior refractures. So why uh, the thoracic erector spinae pain block because basically it's very simple, it's safe and it's effective. So the site of erector spinae pain block is the green asterisk with the spread of the, uh, uh, with the spread uh, usually in the posterior and lateral, but at times it, it, the drug moves into the epidural space as well. While the serratus anterior plane block is the, with the yellow asterisk and it's more lateral and it addresses the lateral cutaneous nerves while the erector spinae, the posterior cutaneous nerves. So the ESPB was mentioned as paravertebral by proxy, but we have to look into the evidence, which is based on cadavers where it mentions it has got unpredictable spread of the injected. If you inject higher up at the level of T1, T2, it spreads higher but not lower while at the level of T7 and T8, it spreads more lower and not higher. Moreover, in four of 12 cadavers, it spread into the paravertebral and blocked the uh, ventral rami, and moreover, it, was, it, it spread into the dorsal rami. Another voluntary study, which mentions about the cutaneous sensory loss on ipsilateral posterior thorax with 20 ml of 0.5% ropivac, and you will see the delineation which occurs more posteriorly and none of, none of the spread which was into the anterior part or the ventral part. Another study which incorporates the MRI along with the uh, uh, cutaneous distribution, it also mentions the distribution which is more posterior and less into the, the ventral. However, when you look into the contrast study, you can see the contrast moving from the, uh, the erector spinae plane into the paravertebral epidural and even on the contralateral side. But you can see the distribution, which is quite erratic, unpredictable, and into all these areas. And this was with 30 ml of 0.2% ropivacin. <clears throat> so why would you use a technique which has got an unpredictable spread, unknown mechanism of action, and a fear of local anesthesia systemic toxicity? There is a discrepancy between the spread of the dye and they say that the, the spread of the dye is not the analytic efficacy, and this is very difficult to perceive. And hence the ESPB, we label it as a dorsal rami block. So what's the ventral rami block? The thoracic paravertebral block has been described 
by many and uh, Manoj in one of his articles mentioned the <clears throat> very exclusively the paravertebral area which is bounded anterolateral by the pleura, medial by the intervertebral foramen, posteriorly by the costal transfer, transverse junction and the paravertebral area itself is divided by the endothoracic fascia into a sub-endothoracic compartment and extra pleural compartment. Since 1994 until 2010, I used the landmark-based thoracic paravertebral block on a couple of occasions, and these were the situations where I implemented the thoracic paravertebral in mastectomies, cholecystectomies, nephrectomies, keeping the patient awake, and Moreover, it was used in multiple rib fractures where 20 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine was injected and catheters were used in some of these uh, scenarios. So how do you do a paravertebral block? Now, this is a paravertebral block with a landmark technique. At the same time, when you start injecting the uh, drug, the surgeon looks from a thoracoscopy uh, inside the uh, inside the, uh, the thoracic cavity as how the uh, drug spreads into the paravertebral space. So 2.5 centimeters lateral to the spinous process, loss of resistance to the costal uh, transverse uh, uh, ligament, which is not as good as the feed of ligamentum flevum. But now here you can see the spread in the paravertebral area with the surgeon pokes with his thoracoscope. You can see the spread from the cephala to caudal and the lateral spread un until the initial part of the intercostal uh, areas. When you start injecting methylene blue dye, you'll get a even more better delineation of the paravertebral space. Catheters can be injected into this space at around three to five centimeters, but beyond five centimeters, it usually has a tendency to go into the uh, intercostal space, and hence it's not recommended that more than five centimeters to be inserted into the uh, paravertebral area. After insertion of catheter, you can see the surgeon trying to move the uh, catheter into the, the intercostal space. And uh, this is the reason why you don't insert more than five centimeters in the uh, thoracic paravertebral space. So when you insert the catheters and uh, inject the contrast, you will find the contrast spreading into the paravertebral space, which will block the motor, the sensory, and the sympathetic nerve. This is the uh, appropriately placed the tip of the uh, paravertebral catheter. And when you inject contrast, it flows in this direction from the uh, prevertebral area into the paravertebral and then into the intercostal area. There is no spread into the uh, epidural space, however. If you insert the needle too lateral, there is a chance of pleural puncture, which I had on several occasions. And this is one of the reasons why you keep the uh, needle exactly in the mid of the paravertebral space or a bit more medial in, into the paravertebral space. Arguments against thoracic paravertebral block is it's technically difficult. There is a fear of pleural puncture, multiple needle placements, and it's a high profile block. I started using ultrasound based from 2010 until 23. The needle is uh, inserted from lateral to medial in the uh, axial plane. It's bed rotated in oblique fashion, so it becomes an axial oblique. And you insert the needle from the lateral to medial and you trespass the inter internal intercostal membrane. If it's in a parasagittal, it, you can easily see the uh, costal transverse ligament and you can uh, trespass the costal transverse ligament to make your needle into uh, come into the paraotal space, which is again a wedge-shaped space as we discussed earlier. So when you have this uh, ultrasound paravertebral block, you can see that the paravertebral area, which is a wedge-shaped space, and between the transverse, uh, uh, between the costal transverse uh, junction and the uh, the pleura, which is anterolateral, and the needle comes from the laterally. Usually, we use uh, the higher gauge needles like the 18 gauge. So as we insert the catheters in that particular plane. But somehow, in uh, in in many of these uh, uh, techniques with the ultrasound, what I found was you find two clicks. One is the click of the mm, the superior costal transverse ligament, and the second is the click of the dura. 
So initially, we never recognized what would be the, the, the ideal click. So we, we sought the second click, and most of the times it was in the epidural space. And then we started using the, the click of the uh, costal transverse ligament. And then uh, we kept the needle tip and the catheter into the paraventral space. So in the initial part, most of the times it was the epidural that we found when we inserted this catheter. So when you inject uh, a local anesthetic at around 15 to 20 ml, you find four vertebral levels with the epidural spread of more than 25%. So many a times when you do a thoracic paravertebral block, it could be a unilateral epidural as well. So after 2016, why was it getting obsolete? Basically because uh, these authors, they came out with a novel idea of using the uh, costal transverse uh, junction as the uh, end point where you insert the needle tip and counter the costal transverse junction and you inject your local anesthetic. After doing some cadaveric studies, they found that the dye spread more into the dorsal area with a possible spread through the costal transverse foramen into the paravertebral area. Somehow, when I screened the original work by Labat, I found that this technique has already been mentioned by uh, Labat way back in the 1920s. So they mentioned paravertebral by proxy, and from 2016, you can find that there was a sudden surge of the published articles until 2018. Uh, beyond that, there was again a slight drop in the acceptance of the uh, uh, ESPB uh, articles. So screening to, through the literature and interacting with uh, Manoj, I found that uh, it's worth reading these articles. So this article mentions to enjoy a benefit of blocking nerves, you inject in the thoracic paravertebral space. The second article says that it could be a RIF2 block. Originally, intrapleural block was dis described, but it had a side demise in 2000. Then ESPB was born in 2016, but the cataract studies, clinical studies, and comparative studies, they mentioned that it's still a dorsal Rame block. And they probably accept uh, that th there could be a RIF2, uh, we don't know the year, of the ESP. And the thoracic paravertebral block is one that remains immortal. However, having said that, the ESPB has got its own applications because it is a dorsal remi block. So most of the back surgeries and the lateral surgeries could be probably have some role of ESPB in these particular scenarios. We had a cadaveric study where we injected at the level of the thoracic erectospinae plane and we found the dye into the paravertebral area. And when we injected it into the paravertebral area, we found it spread into the uh, epidural as well as into the uh, erectospinal plane. So are these communicable? But this all depends, as rightly said by the previous authors, on the caloric type. Now, this was a formalin-based cadaver, which lose, uh, loses most of its integrity in the uh, in in its structure in its structures. So when we did it in the cadaver type thiel based, we found that it spread more posterior and more lateral, and there was hardly any dye in the paravertebral space. And this volume, is it sufficient for a uh, optimal block, is very, very questionable. A very small speck of dye in the paravertebral space. Similarly, the drug could be of a similar volume, and it's very difficult for this volume to block the nerves. They came out with another uh, article where they mentioned that ESPB is almost equivalent to uh, having administered intravenous lignocaine. The plasma levels of these are equivalent to these, and it is quite possible that the analysis which is perceived by the patient could be basically because of the rise in the uh, plasma levels of local anesthetic. And somehow they mentioned that uh, the, this, the, the ESP is an analysis without sensory effects. Again, it's very difficult to pursue uh, this particular concept. So ESP, as claimed by the uh, several of these authors, is not a paravertebral block by proxy because most of the cadaveric and comparative studies mention that it's a dorsal remi block. So then 
coming to the paravertebral block, which has the motor, the sensory uh, uh, nerves, the ventral and the dorsal rami, the sympathetic chain, anterolateral, and the intercostal nerves. When you inject a local in the paravertebral space, uh, space, it moves more lateral uh, into the area of the intercostal. It moves into the uh, intervertebral foramen and probably the epidural space. It moves into the sympathetic chain area and blocks all these nerves. So if you have all the motor sensory and sympathetic, it gives you a evoke motor potential, which is reduced to almost more than 14 hours, which is even not being done by the epidural, uh, epidural uh, analgesia. And also, uh, nothing has been studied about the, the interfacial plane blocks. So this area particularly is, as we have already mentioned in one of our articles, the anatomic barriers in the paraspinal space in the Brazilian journal. Uh, we mentioned that this is a very complex area which has got the motor, which has got the uh, skeletal, osseous and ligamental structures and which might provide an anatomic barrier for the local anesthetic to move from the erythrospinic plane into the uh, paravertebral space. You find the contrast moving into the prevertebral area into the and the paravertebral and the intercostal space and the drug here at this point into, into the intervertebral foramen. It's going into the epidural space, almost the anterior, posterior and the lateral epidural spaces. It also moves into the erectospinal plane and in the coronal plane, it moves over several uh, vertebral levels, almost 20 ml would would move on to four on to four to five levels so it can a single puncture is more than sufficient if you insert catheters it will get produce uh, uh analgesia to an extent which uh no other interfacial plane blocks would do that so this particular article it mentions that the thoracic epidural has become obsolete for the multiple refractors the thoracic paravertebral catheter is the current standard of care. This is what the, this particular article mentions. However, the interfacial plane blocks are slowly replacing the thoracic paravertebral blocks, and it has become very site specific. For example, in our institute, we use ESP for all posterior lateral uh, refractors. As we move on to the lateral uh, uh, refractors, we use the uh, SAP block. And the thoracic paravertebral, basically, we uh, use it for a complex rib fractures like the posterior, the lateral, as well as the anterior rib fractures. And they also mention a high quality prospective studies will be required for an optimal strat strategy which will improve the patient uh, outcome. Going ahead from the uh, multiple rib fractures, there would, there would be strong indication for thoracic paravertebral block for the breast surgeries for the anterior chest wall surgeries and anterior abdominal wall surgeries, where there is some kind of skepticism about the use of the ESP blocks for the breast uh, surgeries as well as these anterior chest and abdominal wall surgeries. So how to improvise on thoracic paravertebral block? So in our uh, cadaveric workshops, uh, I routinely uh, have uh, this kind of specimen, which is a formalin based, and uh, we ask the uh, delegates to uh, have a look at the uh, the anatomical landmarks and try to have a feel of the costal transverse uh, junction as they hit the costal transverse junction and then move on into the paravertebral space. And then we ask them to inject uh, light colored dyes so that they, it helps them to have a confidence of going into the uh, paravertebral space. Now, once we, we do that, we uh, ask them to inject uh, crimson red dye or any other methylene blue dye and ask them to see how it spreads into the paravertebral space. So the delegates are uh, more than happy to uh, do that and they get a lot of confidence before going a step ahead onto the ultrasound cadavers. The spread can be easily seen into the paravertebral space going anterolateral. Uh, we inject around 10 to 20 ml based on the uh, number of delegates. Uh, ultrasound cadavers, we are uh, allowing them to do some niggling and uh, trying to insert the catheters. This was done in the GCS uh, Ahmedabad and subsequently in MGM in uh, Nabi Mumbai as well. 
So having said that, we also did recently a porcine uh, model uh, so on spontaneous ventilation where we uh, inserted the uh, epidural needles into the paravertebral areas. And then we allowed the delegates to do the uh, needling in spontaneously ventilated so that the, they can understand the, the level of pleura and the level of the tip of the needle, how close they are, and do it with the, uh, all the precautions which can be taken to avoid a pleural puncture. So finally, we welcome you for the 40th, 14th annual conference of uh, AORA, which is going to be held at uh, Hyderabad after a resounding success of uh, AORA in uh, Pune, which we organized. Um, Dr. Gopal and his team would be uh, looking after this. We have four days of uh, uh, academic extra vaganza, and the theme is breaking barriers. So welcome again uh, to all to this particular Congress. Thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sandeep. Um, we are looking at the time as well, and we move on to the last talk. To present the last talk, uh, I request Dr. Archana Areti, who is a member of the Board of Studies of Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India and Assistant Professor at the Kovai Medical Institution in the southern part of India. Uh, over to Dr. Archana to share with us her thoughts and the current literature and evidence available on treating adult thoracic trauma, whether we go more towards centineur axis or go more towards uh, facial plane blocks. Over to Dr. Archana. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so very much, sir, for that introduction. Also, I'd like to thank the European Society and the Asian Oceanic Society of Regional Anesthesia for giving me this wonderful opportunity and welcome all of you here for this webinar. So um, uh, my name is Dr. Archana and as sir has already pointed out, I am actually working in the same uh, town as him, but we're on opposite ends of the spectrum. So let's get started. So today, so far what we've seen is Dr. Balavinkat, he took us through the acute trauma management and the on arrival and management of these patients. And then Dr. Rushali took us through the differences in the pediatric regional anesthesia and their physiology management in the trauma setting. And Dr. Devan with his insightful cadaveric explanations of each of the different strategies that are available for the thoracic chest wall. So my job now is just to compare the central neuraxial block options with the facial plane block options and how possibly we can decide on which one to choose for which patient and which one is possibly the better option. So when we're trying to compare these things, what are the things that we look at? Well, you obviously need good analgesia. It has to be a simple procedure with minimum complications and contraindications. And also in the setting of thoracic trauma, we have to have good pulmonary outcomes as well, as well as reduce mortality and morbidity and reduce discharge from the hospital. We're also going to take a small look at the evidence, although Dr. Sandeep has very clearly mentioned most of it. So let's start with the central neuraxial techniques. Basically, these are two techniques, that is the thoracic epidural and the thoracic paravertebral block. So when you look at the thoracic epidural, yes, it is considered a gold standard. It is still the majority of the strategy that people go towards. And in terms of complexity, now when we're Performing an epidural in the surgical setting, it's a quite a different scenario than performing it in a trauma setting. As Dr. Balavinkit has already mentioned, these patients are already in pain, they're already in distress, they might not be as cooperative, and they're probably on oxygen support as well, especially with pulmonary trauma. So it makes this procedure actually a little bit more complex than you would be facing it in these operation room setting. Even if you use an ultrasound, it's still much more technically applicable. So it is not as simple as it would be in an operative setting. That's something that we need to note. In terms of the complications, well, obviously you get a bilateral blockade and which might not be required when you have unilateral side trauma. And also the sympathetic consequent blockade might cause us to have hemodynamic disturbances, which basically would be a contraindication and because we would get hemodynamic instability. So you have to make sure that your patients are uh, stable even before you attempt this procedure. Also in the backdrop of trauma where you can have bleeding and probably coagulopathy, this again is not a technique that should be performed. And even if you have head injuries or any sepsis or any of these kind of conditions, but 
uh, give a give a contraindication to the central neuroaxial or the epidural more specifically. In terms of when uh, established, it is good outcomes. It is well established and equivalent to the non-regional techniques where the the out the time to discharge is the same and uh, the time for you know mortality is the same. However, the pulmonary functions. There are two studies. There is one meta-analysis which states that the pulmonary outcomes are improved, and then there is quite another one to the contrary, which says that you know in patients the pulmonary are actually ingress. So there's quite a little bit of controversy. So that is why I mean, and this study, this has already been projected by Dr. Devan, and they all mentioned that because of these possible doubts and you know hesitations when doing thoracic epidural. Possibly, we should not be considering thoracic epidural as a first choice in trauma. So that's the same, uh, you know, editorial that is done by Bogardi et al., where they also mention the same thing that you know it should not be maybe not the first option, but maybe an option, just not the first one. So with that, they also do recommend to do the thoracic paravertebral. Possibly, that would be the first option, but there is a paucity of data on this. So that being described, let's move on to the thoracic paravertebral block. In terms of analgesic outcomes, it's comparable to the epidural and it provides unilateral analgesia, which is much more beneficial for us, especially if you have unilateral trauma, right? It also does not provide as much hemodynamic instability as an epidural would. In terms of complexity, yes, it is an advanced complex procedure. You do need a significant, a, a little amount of training. It has a, its own learning curve. And, but it has, the technique really has been enhanced by the advent of the ultrasound. Another thing to note in thoracic trauma, in case you have a hemothorax or a pneumothorax, obviously when your endpoint is the dipping down of the parietal pleura, it might be difficult to visualize. And in those instances, or even if there are disruptions in the bone, you might not be able to get the ideal sonoanatomical picture in which instances performing a thoracic paravertebral might be a relative contraindication. And you might need to push on with another or different approach in order to manage that particular patient's pain. In terms of complications, yes, you can have a pneumothorax. You can also have an epidural spread that was so clearly shown to us in all the cadaveric studies depicted by Dr. Bivan just now. And so this is something we should be monitoring if going ahead with these kind of a blocks. As such, coagulopathy is not a contraindication to performing a thoracic paravertebral. However, in thoracic trauma, not many have mentioned that it is a contraindication for paravertebral, but all the point from Dr. Vishali Manstrom where she mentioned that if there is infection pathology, maybe we might not, we want to move away from the, the central neuroaxis rather than going ahead with it. So in other terms of patient outcomes, this, they are similar to the thoracic epidural and the evidence is the analgesia is good. Not that many prospective studies are there in terms of rib fractures. There are case series and there are few uh, trials, but not any good quality to give us a good grade recommendation. So with this end, after that, now we're going to talk about the facial plane blocks and how they are beneficial. So moving on, I'll start from posterior and come anterior. As we have seen already, the erector spinae block, it's quite specific for posterior rib fractures. It, however, it's very simple to per perform, even if, especially if you have an ultrasound, but the landmark has obviously been described. There have been no complications that have been described and no contraindications to the block as such. The outcomes, when successful in the reports, they have mentioned that they are similar to the thoracic epidural. In fact, uh, this particular study by Adhikari et al. mentioned they've done it in about 79 patients where they compared the thoracic uh, erector spinae with the uh, thoracic epidural, but this is a ret uh, retrospective study. And in this aspect, they said that the pulmonary outcome had actually improved quite a bit and maintained a sustained effort even after 72 hours. So this is something to note. Um, then you have the serratus plane block, which again is more specific for anterior or lateral fractures. And this is also a very simple block to be performed as we've already seen. And also the complications and the side effects are quite low and minimal. 
However, again, the studies are limited. However, now that I've discussed these two blocks, I wanted to highlight this one study. It's a very interesting study that I came across. It's a cadaveric study that has been published in the Canadian Journal of, Re of Anesthesia, Anesthesia, in which they've done a cadaveric dye spread. In one hemithorax, they did an intentional rib fracture. And on the other side, they kept everything intact and performed this serotis main block. So what they actually found is that there was more drug spread into the intercostal space and where the nerves actually travel and in the rib fractured side, as opposed to the side that was kept intact. So this, the authors proposed that possibly this is the mechanism of action, wherein it's not reliant on a spread to the paravertebral space or even just directly blocking the nerves, but it's direct local anesthesia spread and the rib fracture actually you know, facilitates the spread in order to enhance the analgesic outcomes. Now, this is not, you know, it's not a study, it's not a trial, it's just a cadaveric depiction, and really this needs to be looked at. But possibly this provides an explanation in why trauma setting, especially with rib fractures, these spatial planes actually do a much better job than in a surgical setting. Now, why I say this? So this is one more study that, you know, where uh, Dr. Devan mentions the volunteer injections into the erector spinae plane. And this is what they noted. This is for an author from New Zealand. And all of those studies and even studies that we have done in our institute where we actually put in bilateral catheter for open heart surgeries and try to see if the erector spinae would provide, you know, good analgesia for them. And every we did it in about 10 15 patients, and this is the similar picture that we got in all of them when we tried to do a sensory mapping. And the pain outcomes for a median sternotomy were not good. It, it didn't really help much, and it was pretty much, uh, you know, we could have just used the systemic analgesia. So this is just our personal experience with this. So the last block here is the interpectoral plane block that has been described for anterior rib fractures and sternal rib fractures. But obviously, if you have a sternum fracture, you would have to do a bilateral block, right? So this is the same. It's previously known as the PEX block. And again, it is quite simple too, but it requires the ultrasound. The complications and contraindications are nil. And the outcomes of this is actually not been studied. It has only been mentioned, in, especially in this one case report, where they had performed this particular block for a patient that sustained bilateral anterior rib fractures as well as a fractured uh, sternum. And they said that the single shot block actually worked pretty well for this particular patient and enhanced, allowed him to participate with his rehabilitation. So the last set of blocks that have been mentioned as a possibility that can be used in a setting of trauma, but not really, ha but have not actually been used. I think only the mid-transverse process block has been, uh, you know, actually published as a case series. They say that when instituted, it has analgesia that is comparable to the TA, but it, of course, it is unilateral. They are quite simple procedures once you can identify the anatomy, but they do require the use of the ultrasound. The landmark techniques are not as descriptive as, uh, you know, we would like. There are, since there is a paucity of data, there have not been reporting any complications. So this, these are just some blocks or also known actually as proxy to the erector spinae block. So this is something that we really need to look into. Maybe with time, these more uh, other blocks might come more into a picture. So this is an excellent review article. It's a narrative review that you know summarizes all the strategies that are available. It gives a good description of all of the strategies available for the fractures. And also it gives a side-by-side -side comparison of the usefulness and the complications. Um, Okay, now that we've basically, you know, done a thing, how do we use it? You know, it, it would be so fun if we had just a wheel or we did an eeny miny mo and we were like, okay, yes, we got, you can just select any random block for anyone and then just decide to do that, that that day. But no, it doesn't work like that. You actually have to have a strategy. And what would be an approach to these management of patients? Well, first you have to look at the patient presentation. They can either have single uh, ribs, they can have multiple ribs, bilateral ribs. They can have multiple segments of the same ribs. So all of these pose a challenge and all of them have a different mechanism. 
and you really need to you know really think out and plan a strategy appropriate for these traumas you can also which can also be complicated by hemothorax and even pneumothorax and icd pain is well i'm pretty sure your patients will be telling you the same thing in addition to trauma chest trauma you also have to be aware of the polytrauma segments where you can have con other concomitant fractures that can complicate your picture one argument is made that well when you have so many fractures why don't you just give a systemic analgesia but still as in when it is amenable it is still preferred to give regional anesthesia you've seen that even uh, dr balavenkit has answered i think one of the questions was if you are going to give be intubated do you really need to address analgesia at that point but as he has already mentioned that if you do it really does improve your outcomes there it reduces the ventilator days so if and when you can use it but just be aware of local anesthetic toxicity and just calculate it to your dose appropriate to your uh, outcomes so this is one particular patient where we managed i just wanted to show you the picture of a typical really severe injury now this gentleman has anterolateral rib fractures from 2 to 8 that's so that's about seven rib fractures he's got a flail segment on that side we are trying to get him there to to do a uh, a procedure for him he's got a shoulder fracture he's not able to move his shoulder also and even on oxygen he's at 92% and he's not able to sit he's not able to do anything on his own he needs so much of an assistance now imagine trying to perform any kind of a strategy or you know any kind of a facilitation for this particular gentleman but this is 3 days after his trauma and clearly things are not getting better so he needs he definitely needs something to help him with this pain he is maxed out on his uh, uh multimodal therapy the only thing that he does not have is a regional technique so in fact what we did do for this particular gentleman is we did a selective supraclavicular nerve block for the shoulder so that that relieves his pain a little bit and we it allowed him to you know cooperate with us and then i we gave him some fentanyl and positioned him very carefully so that we could perform a i did a unilateral multi uh, the paravertebral block and inserted a catheter for him and this particular gentleman he just bounced back within a few days within the next day he was off oxygen he was compliant with his uh, you know uh, breathing exercises and within a 10 days or so he was able to be discharged from the hospital so to summarize quickly what we've just gone through today when it comes to central neuraxial versus spatial pain for thoracic trauma when it comes to quality of analgesia yes the central neuraxial they take the gold medal for this the facial planes are variable and you know we we actually don't have that much evidence right now when it comes to the other patient outcomes when instilled properly both of them seem to be equivalent when it comes to the ease of performance hands down the facial plane blocks are the easier blocks to perform and uh, as opposed to the central neuraxial but when it comes to the complications the thoracic or the central neuraxial blocks obviously have a you know poorer complication profile so having all of this information in hand when you're trying to plan out a strategy it is always beneficial to look not just at the patient and the risk and benefit of each strategy to the patient but you should also look towards your own strength and your own expertise and confidence and the expertise available to you before embarking on any of these strategies you also need to have the appropriate infrastructure as you can see on the most challenging spectrum you need at least four people to help you out with these patients so that your procedures and your techniques are safely done and the quality is maintained so um with this i thank you very much and i hope to see you all at paris in the next week and uh, thank you very much again for your patient listening um thank you very much uh, dr rachna for uh, uh, the interesting evaluation of uh, the centenary axis versus uh, the uh, facial plane blocks and uh, thank you so much for all the speakers and on behalf of the speakers i would like to thank all the participants of the today's session and the leadership of european society of regional anesthesia for giving us an opportunity to share our thoughts from this part of the world and uh, many of the questions which were in the question answer box have been answered and in the interest of time i think uh, we would like to uh, 
probably end saying that uh, from the question that we got from Mexico, uh, which is the simplest interfacial plane block for a beginner, I think uh, erector spinae plane block and serratus anterior plane block uh, would be uh, extremely easy. It's kind of C1, D1 block. And uh, for the uh, other questions, I think uh, the common answer could be whenever there is an uh, injury or trauma to the tissues, either because of surgery or uh, uh, the trauma, uh, we, all that we need to do is to kind of do a mathematical calculation of the involvement of the uh, dermatomes, osteotomes, and myotomes, and decide which block would help us to reach these three places. I think that would answer to most of the questions which are there in the chat box. And uh, with this, uh, we take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, the European Society of Regional Anesthesia for this joint webinar of ISRA and AOSRAPM and look forward to meeting as many of you as possible uh, physically uh, in Paris the coming week. Thank you and good evening to everyone. Thank you so much.